Beautiful choir. Thank you so much. Well, uh, I, I imagine some of you have heard the, uh, I guess we'll call it interesting idea that every 500 years, the church in the world seems to go through this enormous transformation. That at least started in 1024 AD with the Great Schism, and then of course in the 1560s we have the Protestant Reformation, and there are many theologians and thinkers and church leaders in our world right now who are saying that the church is really well into uh, the beginning of yet another sort of reformation because there are so many changes in the church and so many changes in the world around us. First time I heard that idea was uh, from a book written in the late 80s, actually, by Stanley Hauerwas and William Willimon. It's called Resident Aliens, and it was this idea that the church was now located in, in a, a cultural context that was very different than it had been uh, in, in for many decades before that. And we've had many books since then, things like The New Reformation by, by Greg Ogden, and then more recently, The Emergent Church by Phyllis Tickle. Many books, many thinkers thinking about this idea that we are really in the beginning of another reformation. And as I said, that's primarily because of these changes that we see in the church around the world and changes to our mission field, the world around us. Two Saturdays ago, about 50 leaders from our congregation gathered together and we had this retreat. And on this retreat, we talked about our mission and not just about our mission, but we talked specifically about how to carry out our mission. And one of the things we talked about at that re retreat was that very thing, that there are so many changes in the church, in the church in the world, even in Hamblin Church and in our presbytery in Spokane, and there are so many changes to our mission field that it is obvious that God calls us to a new mission. In fact, we talked about how there's no way, things have changed so much that there's no way we could possibly have the same kind of mission or the same kind of ministry strategy that uh, we had 10, 20, or even 30 years ago. And so as leaders, we seek God and we discern God, uh, his will for us and what his plan is for us because we know that change is afoot, that God is doing a new thing, and that is both exciting and a little scary at the same time. And so it's at moments like these, when we see that we're in the midst of change, that we think, gosh, if this is like that change that maybe happened 500 years ago, what can we learn from those, those people, our, our Christian parents in the faith who, who came before us? What can we learn from them that might help us now? And that's why we've been having this sermon series on what we call the five solas or the five sole, if we were conjugating it right, but it doesn't sound quite right. So we, we call it the five solas. And those are these five ideas, five doctrines that we learn from the Reformation that help us be grounded today. Because you know, the primary thing that happened in the Reformation was a realization that there was idolatry in the church and that to combat that idolatry, the most helpful thing would be to return to the core of the Christian faith, the heart of the Christian faith. And we find that we're facing the same thing today. There is idolatry all around us, and we want to return to the core of the faith. And one of the ways of defining that is to affirm these five doctrines that we have been talking about. Now, the word sola, as Joe reminded us wonderfully, means alone or only. And so the first week in this sermon series, we discuss the idea of sola gratia, grace alone. We said we are saved by grace, not works, because every one of these solas has a correction and a positive affirmation. These solas corrected corruption in the church, but they also affirm a very biblical truth. That's where they come from. So sola gratia, grace alone, not works. That's not how we're saved. Then we talked about sola fide, that we live by faith alone, not sight. And then we talked about sola scriptura, that we discern the will of God first and foremost through scripture, not through 
councils of the church say. And then we talked about sola Christus, that we are, uh, that Christ alone is our savior, that we're not self-sufficient. We can't rely on ourselves. So it's, it's Christ alone, not ourselves. And then today we get in some ways the funnest one because it, it summarizes all of them and gives us a reason for all of them. Soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone, which provides us the reason for why we are doing all of it. And that gives us this great grounding as we face changes in the world and in the church to be the kinds of reformed Christians that God calls us to be, grounded biblical Christians when, when the world is in such controversy and there's internal fighting in the, in the church, in, the, in the, the worldwide church, we can be these grounded Christians by affirming those five sola together. And so I'm going to ask you to do something. And I've got to warn you, one of the things, one of my pet peeves, worst preaching moments ever is uh, what I hate is when I'm in a sermon and a pastor makes us do forced small groups. You ever done that? You're like, turn to your partner and say whatever, you know, and, and I love small groups, but to have them be forced on you in a worship service is terrible. I will never do that to you. This is as close as I'll ever come (laughs) right here. I I just want to do this once. We got to do this once before the sermon series is over. We've been calling it high five. We sola gratia, sola fide, sola Christus, sola scriptura, and today, sola Deo Gloria. And I want you to turn to your neighbor and give him a high five. And do it like you mean it. Because this is so affirming and so, so grounding. Um, wait, I didn't get one. Give me. There we go. Right on. And that brings us to our scripture passage this morning. Psalm uh, 115, beginning at verse 1. Actually, just verse 1. Hear the word of God. Not to us, should sound familiar. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There was a a kid, 19-year-old kid, named uh, Dakota Guerin. And he and his girlfriend were hired by someone over in the Vancouver, Washington area to clean their house and do some handyman work. And they did that, and then they left, and the homeowner paid them. But then after they left, the, it might have been the next morning, the homeowner noticed that a very expensive coin collection was missing. It was a coin collection worth almost $100,000. Now, she knew that it had to be Dakota and his girlfriend because nobody else was in the house. But she had no proof of it, so she reported the theft and uh, hoped for the best. Well, a few days later, you might remember this because it was in the newspaper a few years ago, uh, Dakota and his girlfriend went out to see a movie and they bought a movie ticket using coins from the 1930s. <laughs> and the movie theater employee noticed this and thought it was odd but, and, and so later on reported it. Uh, but then later that same night, they, after the movie, they went out to pizza. Rocky's Pizza in in Battleground, Washington. And when they went in there, they paid for the pizza in cash, and their cash included a quarter. And uh, Dakota spent it at face value, 25 cents. Part of, got 25 cents worth of pizza for that that quarter. It turned out to be a Liberty Head quarter that's worth $18,500. So Dakota and his girlfriend just don't, didn't understand value how value works. They, they saw what something said at face value, what it was, but they had no idea its true value. They didn't know where value belonged. 500 years ago, during the Protestant Reformation, that was one of the key issues that was happening. The, the church leaders were looking around and they were realizing that, that Christians at the time were, were assigning value in the wrong places. That value that belongs only to God was getting put onto things and onto people. We honor God when we assign the value that is due only to him to him. And we dishonor God when we assign that value to other things and other people. And so these church leaders 500 years ago were looking around at this, at the Christian church and they were noticing that value was being given to things like, like Mary, the mother of Jesus and, and saints and angels and, and, and cathedrals and even the Pope. 
and many of them felt like those, the value that were, was being assigned to those things were, was the kind of glory that should only belong to God. Now, we should note that uh, this was never the official position of the church. There was never a time when the official doctrine of the church said that those types of, of, of gifts in the church should receive the glory of God, but it was more of a, a common practice sort of thing that they noticed this was happening. And I, I always want to say, too, that we're not talking about Roman Catholics today. We are talking about the worldwide church at the time. Uh, in fact, the the Roman Catholic Church had a counter-reformation not long after the Protestant Reformation that corrected some of the things that we've been talking about. But even this one, we could make the case that there was never really a time when this was okay with anyone in the church. But it was happening. And so these reformers reacted against that, and that's one of the reasons why that's our, five, one of the, our last five sola, five sole, is because... Um, uh, we give God the glory alone. The reformers looked around and they saw this. They saw this, what they determined was idolatry. And they said, not to us. It's not where the glory goes. Not to the church. That's not where the glory goes. But to God be the glory. Anything else that gets glory that is due only to God is an idol. Now, in Psalm 115, it's actually a complicated psalm, so it's a good thing we only read the first verse. Those first verses of psalms are, are very helpful. They teach us a lot about what the rest of the psalm means. But that psalm is a, a communal lament, and the people who use this psalm in worship have found themselves surrounded by idols. They found themselves where value is being assigned to things that don't deserve the sort of, of value and glory that they're receiving. This psalm, Psalm 115, is one of the psalms that we, we know are, are, are post-exilic. If you, if the, the, you know, you, the southern kingdom of, of Israel was a conquered by the Babylonians. The Babylonians took the southern kingdom people away to Babylon. And then many years later, the Persians defeated the Babylonians and the people of the southern kingdom of Israel returned to their home. They were exiled, but then they came back. And when they came back, their homeland was very different. And so they come back, they're worshiping God, but what they find themselves in is this very alien, very hostile environment where there are nations all around them that do nothing but worship idols. And so in this psalm, they affirm that they are not one of those nations. They do not worship idols. And the nations around them in the psalm mock them. They ask things like, where is your God? Because they were used to gods they could see. And the response from the psalmist later on in Psalm 115 is, our God is a living God, a God who is in heaven. Our God is not a God that is just made from metal workshops. And so that's why the psalmist writes, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. And then the second part is this implied mission of the people of God. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, O Lord, for your sake, for your name, give glory for the sake of of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. That's why we give God the glory, because there is this implied mission there of being the people of God, honoring God's steadfast love and his faithfulness, living in the context of God's steadfast love and faithfulness in a world that's hostile, in a world that's alien, in a world that is full of idolatry. And so the people of God live that mission out and as they do that, they give glory only to God. This is why we've been talking about our mission as a church. This is why we had that retreat that I mentioned two weeks ago. Only one reason, to give God the glory. Two weeks ago when we did meet for that retreat, 
we continued our process, not just of talking about what our mission is, because at this point, we're very clear about what our mission is. We are called to grow active followers of Jesus Christ and to build his community. We know what that means, some of us more than others. We've defined what an active follower is. We've talked about what community is. We know and believe as leaders and as people, I think there's a lot of engagement in our congregation with with that at least to say this is what God is calling us to. But what we're talking about together now and we're all trying to do together is to answer the question, but how do we do it? It's one thing to say we have this mission, but it's another thing to really discern how God is carrying that out through the life of our congregation and joining him intentionally in it. And we don't have all the answers. We're not there yet. When the reformers in the 1560s started, they didn't say, hey, we've got these five solas. It actually took hundreds of years and people looking back on what they did to to define those solas together. There was a contemporary of, of Luther, Melanchthon, who named three solas, but it took longer for us to look back and see what that trajectory was and see God at work. And that's where we are at together. We're saying we don't have all the answers, but we think we know and we're praying. We've prayed about it and we've discerned it. We've done things like that congregational survey that many of you might remember. That was a while ago and we've had meetings and conversations and then this retreat. And we have been, been uh, uh, listening to one another. And so at, at this point we met we talked about where we think God is working, and we asked every, every team in the church, every committee in the church, to just play with this a little bit, to experiment with it a little bit. And so every team went home with some way of dabbling in what we're calling a new potential ministry process to say, how do we do our ministry together? And we're doing that for the glory of God. No other reason. We're calling that process connect, grow, and love. And I'm not going to talk about it too much right now because we're exploring this together and we hope that you'll be engaged with it. I'd love to have coffee with you, talk about the life of the church and how we see God at work. But as we talked about people connecting in a group, Simple, keeping it simple. People connecting in a group, people growing in worship, and people loving one another in a team. Connecting, growing, and loving. We've observed that that's the story of many of you. That that is how God has worked in your life through Hamblin Church. And we see God continually doing that. And we don't want that to just be happening accidentally. Uh, it's not accidental. God's doing it. But we, we want to join with God intentionally and see that be lived out. And so this summer, especially, I think we're really going to uh, hammer that out and move forward with that in a way that I am super excited about to be effective for God in this new cultural context, this new church context, this reality that we're really in maybe this kind of second reformation that we're in. It's so exciting, but there's only one reason we're doing any of it. Soli Deo Gloria. We're not doing it to make a bigger church. We're not doing it to make us feel better about ourselves or build our budget or, or have a better building. We're not doing it for any of those reasons. We're doing it to bring God the glory. That's the only reason we're doing it. Let me give you a, a, a silly example of, of how this works out in the life of a church. I've served, you know, uh, eight different churches in different capacities, and uh, one of my previous churches, I won't say which one, uh, replaced all of the pews in their sanctuary with chairs. They needed new, new pews. And uh, that was a very helpful thing to do because it helped that church carry out mission. They wanted to use the building uh, for different reasons. They wanted to have gatherings in the, that room that would help carry out the mission. But for some people, it was very difficult to give up those pews because pews are such a, a visible and regular and traditional part of the worship life of a congregation. 
Now, I know this is silly because probably we wonder, well, why would anyone care about what the, the seating is, is like, right? Uh, but nonetheless, it, it was a difficult thing. And, and now, we don't have to worry about that here, by the way, because our floor is slanted. So I don't know how chairs would ever work. Um, but uh, it enabled them to do some things that they believed that God was calling them to do. But nonetheless, it was difficult. And so the question is, and it's a silly, easy question at this point, when do the pews become an idol? When do we assign value to the pews that don't belong to the pews? Because God's called, in this case, that church to a particular mission, and doesn't it give God the glory to assign God the glory and follow his mission than to assign the glory or the value to the seating in the sanctuary? By the way, they weren't really chairs. They connected together. We should have called them sectional pews but they were chairs. <laughs> that kind of thing matters, I think. So when, when do pews become like the saints or the pope or the, uh, the angels 500 years ago in that situation? And then the harder question, that's a silly example, but it gets us started because we, we want to think and ask ourselves then, and this is so hard, what what is our idol? Where do we assign glory that only belongs to God to something else? Could it be doctrine? I don't think we could do that with the five solas because the five solas are the core, the heart of the Christian faith. But there are certainly beliefs that are outside the core of the Christian faith that we might disagree about and decide that we can't do mission together because of it. And when that happens, maybe that doctrine's becoming an idol for us because we're giving too much value to it. Could it be music? Maybe there's a style of worship that we assign too much value to. Could it be budget? Could it be politics or personal preferences, that we lift these things up in ways and make them more important than they are or they ever should be. And that's why this, this sola comes in and shakes us up and says, not to us, not to the church, but to God be the glory. This is when it's interesting being part of a church asking these questions. It's a tough question. It's a really hard question. Ask that question. What, is, what, is, what idols do we have? I love being a part of a church that asks these tough questions. This is not a church where we just come to feel good about ourselves all the time, make nice people even nicer. We challenge each other. And so this is a, a challenging question. Name your idol. Whatever it is, it could be a really good thing. I'm not saying whatever that is is a bad thing, but it doesn't deserve the glory and neither do we. And so the psalmist writes, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. I want to do something a little different this morning, and I'm going to ask, I hope this works, I want us to uh, memorize together, and then we're going to say it many times together, just the first phrase of that psalm. So I want us to say together, I'll say it once, then, then I'm sure you'll have it down and we'll go. Uh, but um, it's not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Let, okay, yeah, you, you guys, uh, let's, okay, let's, we'll do it in two parts, but then we're doing it together. Okay, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Let's do it all together now. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Now, I'm going to read just 10 sentences, and I want that to be the response. We're going to talk about the ministry and mission of the church, and why we do it is not for us. It's not to preserve the church or to make ourselves feel good. It is for the glory of God alone. Only God's name gets the glory. Soli Deo Gloria. 
But the trick to make this work is we can't do this like uh, a typical congregations do this, where we say things in unison. And I don't know if you're any Star Trek fans out there, but it always sounds a little bit like the Borg to me when we're just saying our unison things together. To make this different, we have to say this with, with passion and excitement. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. So you ready? Here we go. When a guest comes to our church on a Sunday morning and is greeted warmly at Hamblin, when that happens, when someone is welcomed, we say, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. When the music in our church inspires us, we say, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. When we meet our neighbor, just somebody maybe right across the street from the church or in, in our, this neighborhood that God has called us to, when we meet someone, we say, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. When we invite someone into our small group and they become our brother and sister in Christ, we say, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. When we say our mission statement so much that it sounds repetitive to us and we get tired of it, but we know that for other people around us, it's actually the first time that they're hearing it. When we do that over and over again, we say, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. And when we try a, a new ministry and it doesn't work, it fails. We say, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. And when we try a new ministry and it's amazing and God does amazing work, we say, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. When the gospel is preached, we say, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. And when there's a change and we lose something about Hamblin that we just love, even then we say, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. And here's the best one. When God uses one of us to draw someone close to Jesus Christ, we say, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Let's stand and give glory to God.